I want to continue on with some of the same text that we've been talking about the last few weeks that we've been reading out of 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm going to take verse 7 and just, just to the little front part of verse 8. Because I want to talk about a love that lasts. And when you're talking about a love that lasts, you're talking about a covenant relationship. Something that we know nothing about. Uh, the Bible defines covenant relationship, but our generation doesn't know anything about covenant. And nobody said amen in that proof. Yeah. But I want to read uh, 1 Corinthians 13. They've got a handout that they are giving to you. And as you get those, I'm going to read those. The scripture into your hearing. It says, love, is always, love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. And love never fails. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. And love never fails. Now you may be sitting there this morning and you may say, Oh, Pastor, I, never, I haven't experienced that in my lifetime. I've seen my parents go through divorce. I've been through divorce. My friends are getting divorced. And it doesn't look like love lasts at all. And it looks like it fails continually. But that is just not true. Amen. Even though what this world is showing us and what we have experienced does not mean that love failed. It means that something happened in the relationship and somebody gave up on it. Amen, preacher. Keep Amen. on preaching. I think I will. Because when somebody gives up on love, it's not the love that fails, it's the people that fail. Right. <laughs> but it's hard for us to grasp that in the context of what we've experienced in our life because if we've been a part of a, a, a family that has suffered divorce or if we've been divorced ourselves, there's some things you go on and you look at them and you go, well, love failed me. No, no, no. Love did not fail you. Because there's some context of love that's been twisted and distorted in our day and in our generation and with our people and with our teenagers and with our children and with our youth. It's because we look at love as a sexual thing and love has nothing to do with sex at all. Amen. So girls, if that guy looks at you and say, if you love me, baby, you know what? You look at him and say, love ain't got nothing to do with this. We have a song that says something like that. It's just a second. But you see, we have based love on a feeling. Your feelings are going to lead you wrong. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. There have been many a time in my life that I had a feeling in God because you better get rid of that feeling because you're going to get in trouble. So feelings are going to lead us to a place where we really don't need to go. Listen to this statement. You can't love God without loving people. And you can't love people unless you've loved God. That's right. You see, because all we have is human love, and that's all that we ever know if we haven't accepted Jesus Christ into our heart and life. But when you accept Jesus into your heart and life, that changes the whole definition of love. Amen. Because you heard me talk about it last week. It goes from a conditional love to an unconditional love. It doesn't matter what you do. God won't love you any more than He loves you right now. And I'm so thankful for that because there's some things I did in my lifetime that I thought would have made him love me a whole lot less. But it didn't. I think it made him love me more. And I'm glad of that. You see, we can't have a love that lasts without having an experience with God. 
We can't have a love that lasts without having an experience with God. And you go, Pastor, well, my, the love that I had, it didn't protect, it didn't trust, it didn't hope, it didn't persevere, and I think it failed me. It's because you tried to do it on your own. Come on, somebody. It's because you tried to love on your own and you really didn't know what love was. I want, I want to give you five things here and there on your list there. I want to give you five things. Uh, there's five, I think there's five blanks to start off with. I want to give you these. If you're a note taker, if I don't get to all of it, I'll just fill in the blanks. If I don't finish it, I'll finish it. I'll fill in the blanks at the end, but I hope I get to all of it because I'm going to go really fast through some of these. Uh, but your first one, and five things that will help make love last. The first thing is make a covenant commitment. Nobody likes that word commitment. My wife said I have commitment issues. <laughs> I'm like, baby, I committed to you. I'll ask her, what, I, she'll ask me, what do you, where do you want to go to eat? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> she said, well, well what do you want? You want to go here or you want to go here? I go, I don't know what you want to do. Anybody feeling me? Because you see, if I commit to one place, it might be a place that she don't like, and I don't want her to go somewhere and eat somewhere she doesn't like because I want us to both enjoy the meal. So I wonder what you want. And, and she'll say, well, what are you doing next weekend? And I look at her, I don't, I don't know. Well, I, I need to know what you're doing next weekend so I can make plans. I'm like, hey, come on, man. Don't push me. And that's when she looks at me and goes, you got a problem with commitment. And we all have a problem with commitment, amen? amen? Because if the pastor asks you to do something, you're like, oh, I don't know about that preacher. Because of past experience, you think when somebody asks you to do something, you're locked in that to life, but you're not locked in it for life. We just want you to get up off the seat and start doing something so God can start using you so He can start blessing you in your future. Amen. Ah, come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. God didn't save you for you just to stand in this seat. Amen. So commitment is a very interesting word to the generation in which we live in because we have what they call prenuptial agreements now before you get married. Did that sound like a love that's going to last to you? That sounds like to me they're just trying to figure out a way that they can just have a little fun and then get out whenever they want to. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. So commitment is a very interesting word. And we don't really like doing it a whole lot, but we need to commit to something. First of all, we need to commit to the Lord is what we really need to do. Amen. Commitment is important. Important. It's very important for the days when I feel like an adult today. Anybody ever felt like that? My wife asked me the other day, she was getting ready to go to work, and I was, I was lazy that day. I didn't, I didn't get up when she got up. I was lazy. She said, what you going to do today? I said, I ain't getting out of this bed. <laughs> well, she knew that was not true because I was going to get up. But that's the way I felt. When she asked me that question, that's the way I felt. I'm like, I ain't getting I'm going to cover my head up, and I'm going to let this day go right on by. But in actuality, I can't do that, and neither can you. We have to make a commitment. We have to be able to do something. But there's sometimes I don't need a commitment if I like what I'm doing. Amen. Let me give you an example. That first day of deer season, when it comes in, whoo! Man, I look like that and I'm ready to go. I'm excited. Ain't nobody got to pry me out of the bed. I'm pumped. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to kill something. And you see, that's the way we are when it comes to doing things that we like to do. If I'm excited about it, I'm going to do it whether I'm committed to it or not. And I don't need commitment to do that. Amen. Why don't we do that with our marriages? I'm married. I know every day is not going to be a good day, but I'm in it to win it. Amen. Amen. Why don't we do that with some friendship? Now, there are friendships that are only last for a season. And we need to recognize those friendships and go, hey, 
I love you and I appreciate the, how you stood by me for this long, but it's time for me to go to the next season and I don't think you're going to be able to go with me. And nobody has to be mad. It just has to be a mutual agreement and let everybody know, hey, God's taking me to a new season. It's time for me to go. i got to find somebody else that can get me where God wants me to go. But we got to commit to something. Amen. You see, the problem a lot of time with us, man, I wish somebody had told me this early on in my marriage. That if early on you will make up your mind, no matter how tough it is, that you're going to take that divorce word, throw it out the door, and not use it as an option at all, that that's just not even going to be on the table, throw it out the door, man, will things be a whole lot better. Amen. Because when you start throwing that divorce word around, man, you got demons coming out of everybody. I wish somebody had told me that early on. How many, I'm gonna get, how many between year five and year ten? Man, you was like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, you ain't going to be honest in church? Come on. Between year five and year ten, I'm like, man, you know what? I, I ain't got to put up with this. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Amen. How about, how about, how about, I don't know if the ladies have ever heard that you will say that word. I don't know if I should say my wife in here. <laughs> there was a phrase that used to be used. I don't know. I know it was with the guys. I don't know about ladies. They used to call it the seven-year itch. You see, we keep those things as options when we ought to never have that as an option to start with. Amen. Because it would make life a whole lot easier. You know, and, 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 then, and then for whatever reason, when guys hit their late 30s, early 40s, it's, it's almost like they go crazy. It's almost like they got to get that last little bit of youth out of them so they just lose their mind and they just go crazy. And they go out and buy them a sports car knowing they can't afford a sports car. And they act like they're the lady man when if they looked in the mirror, they wouldn't really be acting like that. <laughs> yeah, but we got to make a commitment. God wants us to have a love that lasts. Amen. It's a love that lasts. So you've got to have a covenant commitment. I'll come back and I'll explain that word covenant in just a little bit. Number two, you've got to celebrate differences. <laughs> oh, glory. <laughs> you've got to celebrate the differences. You know, you don't need to marry somebody like you. Amen. Let me give you an example. One of you may be a neat freak, and the other one is, well, a slob. One of you may be a spender, and the other one is a saver. How about this one? <laughs> I got personal experience on this one. One of you may be a talker, and the other one is not. <laughs> but you've got to celebrate the difference. If you let it, those differences will irritate you. Right. But you see, you ought to celebrate them because surely you don't want to be married to you. I know I don't want to be married to me. Praise God, my wife has put up with me for 33 years. I don't know how she's done it. Yeah, September will be 34. I don't know how she's done it. I'm not easy to live with. And neither are you. <laughs> No way I would want to be married to me. You see, I have to be married to somebody that's different than me so that we can actually get along. Amen. Because if I was married to me, there ain't no way I'd get along. <laughs> so you got to celebrate those 
differences instead of letting them irritate you. Hey, how about instead of letting them irritate you, how about appreciate those differences? Preacher, you don't live with my husband. I get tired of picking up his nasty clothes out of the floor and they're a foot from the dirty clothes in my garage. It drives me crazy! <laughs> Sometimes us guys do that to see how long you're going to keep picking it up. <laughs> and then as long as you keep picking it up, we'll keep throwing it down. My wife taught me early on. She said the clothes hampered right there while your clothes laying right there. I thought, Mama always picked them up. She said, you ain't married to your mama. Yeah. That's right. She set me straight early. <laughs> but we got to celebrate some of those differences. Appreciate them. Don't let them irritate you to the point where you can't stand to be around them. Number three, this is a tough one. You've got to work on communication. Work on communication. It, let me give you some numbers here. The average couple, the average couple only spends four minutes a day in meaningful conversation. The average married couple, <laughs> Amanda's looking at Jane, huh? <laughs> the average couple spends four minutes a day in me, not just conversation, in meaningful conversation. Meaningful. I've gave this next statistic before. I didn't come up with it. I'm just reading it off of here. Don't get mad with me about this one. I'm, I'm, I'm just reading. The average woman speaks 30,000 words per day. The average man speaks 15,000 words per day. And I think the women save the majority of their words so that when the husband gets home, she can hit him with it. <laughs> When I've already used up my 15,000 words and I just want to sit there and look at this one-eyed monster in a daze. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Because if you're going to have a love that lasts, you've got to learn how to communicate. Amen. Whether you're tired or not, you got to learn how to communicate. And in my 15,000 words, I better be saving some of those for when I get home. Because she's going to want to talk because she's still got like 25,000 words left. <laughs> Can I get an amen, men? Amen. amen. There's two critical areas in your relationship that you have to communicate about. Two critical areas. The first one is finances. You have to communicate about finances. You have to. If one of you is a spender and the other one is a saver, you've got to communicate about finances. I am the spender. I'll just hold my hand. If I can get my hand up there, that light, I'd stick it on up, but I can't get it that high. I am the spender. Matter of fact, just, just this last week, somebody asked me to buy something. And then they go, well, did you tell your wife? I'm like, don't I always? <laughs> I did this time. But you got to communicate about finance. You have to. My wife does ours. Thank God for that. She loves numbers. I hate numbers. She's a mathematician. I'm not. I'm from Red Spring. No said. She makes sure it balances down to the penny. penny. Down to the penny. If she can't find a penny, it drives her crazy. 
I would be like, if it's under 100, don't worry about it. But she says, penny. I got to have it to the penny. Thank God she's like that because that keeps us straight. So you've got to communicate about finances. If you're going to buy something big, you need to tell your spouse. Amen. I'm on somebody. Yeah. If you're going to buy something big, you need to talk to your spouse about it and you need to be in agreement about it. Don't talk to your spouse and she said no or he said no. I don't really think we need that. Man. You know, I don't care what you tell me. We'll get it in here. <laughs> because I know that's the way a lot of relationships work. Because I have told my wife before, don't you do something. She, what does she do? And you've told your spouse, don't you do something? Because she can look at me and go, don't you do something? I'm like, uh, uh. What did you just say? I tell you, don't you go do that. I'm out of here. I'm going hunting. Amen. <laughs> but you got to communicate. Finances. Very important. Number one argument among married couples is money. Number two argument among married couples is sex. I'm not going to get into that a whole lot today. That's the number two. But you got to communicate about finance. The second thing you got to communicate about is your schedule during the week. What are you doing? What are you doing? Where are you going? Who are you meeting for lunch? What kind of appointments do you have? Do you have any dog? You've got to communicate about your schedule. Honey, I've got to work late on Tuesday. But in your scheduling, you know what you need to do? You need to set up some time for each other. You hear me? Husband and wife still need some alone time. Children or no children. You still need some alone time. You need to go on a date. But you've got to communicate about your finances. You've got to communicate about your schedule. And then number four, that leads us to number four. And this is where we're going to talk about you got to feed the romance. you got to feed the romance. You know, I've got a fireplace in my house, and I took and I had gas logs installed into that fireplace, but that rascal never has a fire in it. I'm like, why don't my fireplace have a fire in it? It's because I don't go over there and put the fuel. So romance has to have Fuel. You have to make an effort to keep the romance into the relationship. It's not going to burn on its own. Amen. Amen. That's right. Ladies, y'all will be screaming about now because, I man, you have complained about your husband. Oh, he, he don't ever want to go out with me no more. All he wants to do, he, all he just wants to do is have sex and that's it. He's not romantic at all. Guys, we got to put some fire in it. we got to put some fuel there because the fire will go out if you don't continue to put fuel in it. Amen. How about your relationship with the Lord? Come on. Come on. I'm, 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 gonna go, I'm, I'm going here. I'm, I'm going here. Because I've heard so many people say, oh, that fire that I had when I first got saved, it done went out and I don't even feel like I'm saved anymore. Where did It's not God's fault it went out. That's right. It's our fault. So if the fire in our relationship with the Lord has went out, or if the fire in the romance of your marriage has went out, it's not the marriage's fault. It's your fault. Because you didn't put some wood in the fireplace, you didn't turn the gas on the gas logs, You just thought it was on automatic. You just think your wife's supposed to crawl your bones every time you walk in the door. Just for no reason. I got news for you. You ain't all that. You don't turn her on every time she sees you. Your musky smell does not turn her on when you walk in the house. You 
You've got to feed the romance for it to stay alive. A marriage needs romance. Do you know that romance can be sexless? I, saw every, I think I saw every guy's mouth drop to the floor. What? That's why you're doing it, eh? <laughs> you mean I don't get no benefit at the end? Yeah, you do. You get to stay married. You get to stay married. You get to continue to have a love that lasts. Happy wife? Happy life. No. We need to feed the romance. Number five. This is the most important one. Put Jesus at the center. This is the most important one. You have to put Jesus at the center of any relationship, whether it's a marriage or a friendship. You have to put Jesus at the center of the relationship. Why are we going to leave out the one who created the relationship to start with? He's the one that said in Genesis, you will leave your father and mother and cleave to each other and you shall become one flesh. The creator should never be left out of the relationship. Amen. And so that's why we're running about, the last report I saw that we're running about 49% divorce between Christian and non-church. People that are running about the same, running around 49. It's because we're leaving Jesus out of the center. Jesus has to be the center of the relation. How do I know that? Psalm 127, verse number one. Unless the Lord builds the house, it builders labor in vain. I can't build anything that will last without the Lord. Come on, son. I'm trying to help you here. I'm trying to help you here. In order for a relationship to work, let the one who designed the relationship define that relationship. You got to let God speak into it. You see, the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, is horrible picture of man's failure. And they failed because they were trying to do it their way. Horrible picture. But here God is trying to tell them some things in order to get them back straight. Look, look at this. Malachi 2, verse 13 through 16. You flood the Lord's altar with your tears. You weep and you wail because He no longer looks with favor on your offering or accepts them with pleasure from your hand. And then here, here's what we would do. Why? <laughs> That's what we would do, right? You ask why. The Lord answered you. It's because the Lord is the witness between you and the life of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. There's that word, covenant. Covenant means till death do you part. In the Old Testament, covenant meant that can't be broken unless one of us dies. They used to try to take and cut their hands and they would put their hands together and tie them around and say, this is a symbol of a blood covenant, but we know you can't transfer blood really that way, but this was just a thing that they did. Going, this is a blood covenant and, and, and we swear by this blood covenant that it will not be broken unless one of us die. That's what God intends for marriage to be. Got too many children in here to go into that in detail. But how many of you know what's going to happen the first time a woman is with a man? A 
looking. We're up. Shake your head like this if you're adults now. The children don't know it's okay because I'm not going in detail with it. But shake your head like this if you know. It's called the blood covenant. That's why it's supposed to be saved for marriage. Because it's supposed to be in a relationship that the love will last forever of where the covenant is saying, I will not break this unless one of us die. Did you have in your wedding vows till death do us part? Some people are leaving that out nowadays. I've done several weddings where they've left that out. They didn't want that part in there. But just because you leave that out of your wedding vows does not make it so. Let me, let me, let me give you... Oh, Jesus. Let me finish reading that. Has not the one God made you? You belong to Him in body and spirit, and what does the one God seek? What does God seek from you? He seeks godly offspring. So be on your guard. Do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should. What? Mm. So the Lord shall be on your guard. If you... If you've experienced divorce in your life, you know how traumatic it is. Very traumatic. I'm not telling you to go back and undo anything. I'm telling you God is a God who forgives us. And we move on. But he did not make marriage for it to fail. Come on, somebody. Luke 22, 20. In the same way, after the supper, he took me and Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Jesus came and did away with the old covenant. The old covenant was they had to bring sacrifices to the priest, and the priest had to kill the animals, and he did the, offered the blood here, and then they took the meat and did something else with the meat. I did a whole big ritual that they went through with that. But when Jesus came, he was implementing a new covenant. Thank God he did because of be pretty bloody around here. Thank God he came and he implemented a new covenant. But he said, I come to establish a blood covenant with you because I'm going to die for you. And he did. He loved us that much. His love asked. He shows us how to do that. I'm going to skip a whole bunch of stuff. I'm going to go down and fill in your blank. Covenant is based on mutual commitment. This means we're willing to be unhappy while we're working. Come on, somebody. A mutual commitment means I'm willing to be unhappy until we work this out. I can stand up here. If my wife was standing up here with me, she'd tell you anything. We have fell in and out of love a whole bunch of times over 33 years. That's why you never follow your feelings. Because your feelings will get you in trouble. Your feelings are like, well, I don't love you no more. I'm leaving out of here. No, no, I married you till death do us part. We're going to work through this thing and the feelings will come back. So you've got to have a mutual commitment. This means we're willing. A contract is based on mutual distrust. Anybody that deals with contracts on a daily basis, you'll know that the language inside of the contract is to protect the person that is selling something. So inside of a contract, the person that's being that's selling is protecting it. This is what the bank does. Hey, you're going to sign these papers, but let me tell you what's going to happen if you don't make your payment for your house. There's nothing in there about you being faithful to the contract. The only language is, hey, let me tell you what you're going to do if you don't. So it's only about protecting. So they have a distrust already built into the contract. And that's why God says your marriage is not a contract. It's a covenant because I want you to trust each other from the start. And I don't want you to have any reason to say you're through. Number two, covenant surrenders rights and assumes responsibility. It 
surrenders his right and assumes responsibility. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? Amen. He surrendered his own right. He assumed responsibility for my sin and for your sin. Contract protects rights and shrinks responsibility. That way you can say, well, it's not my fault. Sure it is. You may be saying, oh, it wasn't my fault when you divorced you. Yeah, you did. You gave up. It may not be all your fault, but you were part of it because you gave up. You've heard me say this before. I'm going to say it now. If you're in a, a physically abusive relationship, get out. God does not want you to be used as a doormat. Amen. He loves you too much for that. I'll never tell a woman that's been physically abused to stay in a relationship. Or a man these days, I've seen men get beat down. Number three, covenant has the interest of the other in mind. The interest of the other in mind. You know what that means? That means you're not selfish, but you're selfless. You're giving up your interest for the other. And then the contract has personal convenience in mind. What's best for me? That's what the contract does. The contract is always protecting what's best for the person issuing the contract. Not the same. Here's two principles. I don't teach. Two principles that will greatly benefit you. Number one, love is not a feeling, it's a choice. I'm going to say that till you get it. Love is not a feeling, it's a choice. Come on, somebody. Love is not a feeling, it's a choice. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Love is not a feeling, it's a choice. I'm going to say it till you get it because I don't think we understand that because this world has taught us that love is a feeling. Follow your feeling. What did your heart tell you? <laughs> That's going to get you in trouble and going to take you down more roads than you can handle. What you better follow is God's Word. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's what you better follow because God's Word is never going to lead you astray. You're never going to make a wrong turn. You're never going to make a wrong decision when you're following His Word. So love is not a feeling. It's a choice. Many people qualify their lives based on how they feel. Can I, can I tell you something? If I pastor off of my feelings, you think I'd still be here? You can go ask any pastor that question. If we pastored off our feelings, we would not be pastoring. Because there have been days that my feelings said, get out. You've had enough. I guarantee you there's some days in your relationship with your spouse that you said, I've had enough. I'm getting out. See, you're trying to follow your feelings and not making the choice to love that lasts. Feelings will always tell you to get out. They will lie to you. Here's what we need to be doing. Love doesn't give the person what they deserve. Love gives the person what they need. Amen. Amen. Love doesn't give the person what they deserve. Love gives the person what they need. Because you see, if Jesus gave us what we deserved, we would all die in our sins. Amen. But thank God, He gives us what we need, which is forgiveness when we ask Him. 
So in, sometimes when you're in the middle of all these circumstances that life seems to throw at you, instead of giving your spouse maybe what they deserve, which is a chewing out of a royal kind, maybe you need to just give them a smile and say, I love you anyway. Because I guarantee you, my wife would tell you there's been days that I didn't deserve her love. She gave it to me. And if I'm alive, I hope she stayed with me 33 more years. Amen. There will be days within the next 33 years that I won't deserve her love. But I hope she gives it to me again. Number two, final piece. Number two, capacity to love comes from receiving love. You see, many of us don't know how to receive love. Because we gauge love on what we've experienced in the past. It could be from abuse, it could be from rejection. It could be from all kinds of circumstances going on. It could be from adoption. You were given away. Uh, but I want you to understand that if you were adopted by a family, that means they chose to love you. Amen. But you see, we have to be able to love. The only way that we have the capacity to love is by receiving love. And for many of us in here, that's so hard because we take uh, uh, our love from our experience, from our parent, parents that have raised us, and that's the way we gauge love, and sometimes that's not a good way to gauge love because that was always conditional. Boy, if you do what I tell you to do. Girl, my brother and I always want a sister. Can I tell you why we always want a sister? Because we want to make her wash the dishes because we got time to wash them. <laughs> we, didn't have, we didn't have a dishwasher back in the day. Me and him all went, I sure wish we had a sister. We'd make her be washing these dishes. We wouldn't do it. You see, because we, we it, it, the culture in which we were raised in had ingrained in us that that was woman's work. Come on, somebody. Even now we got dishwashers and men, we can load those too. Even though I don't. I'll tell you why I don't. Because if I load it, my wife opens it up and puts something in, she takes everything out and rearranges it anyhow. So why should I put them in there? She's going to rearrange them. So this is why I do. I rinse them off in the sink and I set them by the mother's sink. And she goes, why don't you put them in the dishwasher? I said, because you're going to rearrange it if I do it. So I'm not doing it. So that's one of those things that we know that she puts them in the dishwasher. Now, I'll get them out, and I'll put them up, but I ain't putting them in there because I know she's going to rearrange them. How about this? First John 4, 9, this is what it said. We love each other because he first loved us. Amen. I need somebody to love me when I don't feel like being loved. I need somebody to love me. I don't deserve love. I need somebody to love me even when I might be unlovable. And I need love that's going to last forever. If I could get the band to come on back up. You see, in all these verses we're reading, Jesus is telling us that I want to love you like this. I'll give you a love that lasts. I'll give you a love that's unconditional. I'll give you a love that will always be there that you can always count on. I love you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I need a love even when I may lash out in anger, I need somebody to love me. But you see, Jesus can do that for us. I can be mad with him and he's still going to love me. And by the way, I want you to know, sometimes I get mad with him. 
You go, oh, Richard, you ain't supposed to get mad with God. He knows I'm mad, so why not tell him? Why not tell him? If I'm in a relationship, then I'm going to tell him, right? Why am I going to go, oh, no, I ain't mad. It's okay. No, I'm mad! I had one instance where I went upstairs and I closed the door. I left my wife downstairs. I was so mad. I went upstairs and I closed the door again. And, well, God didn't see no talking at that point, but I did a lot of talking. And I did a lot of screaming. I did a lot of crying. And I took every book I had on my shelf and I threw it at the wall and the door. I had my little temper tantrum. I threw everything. There was nothing left on the shelf. I'm like, God, I'm doing this. I don't understand. This is not what I prayed for. You know this is not what I... And I'm just throwing stuff because I'm screaming. And so finally, when I exhausted all my means and I didn't have no more books to throw, everything was already laying on the floor. I sat down on the chair. Guess what? Guess, guess what? The Lord goes, are you finished? <laughs> yeah, I ain't got nothing else to throw. And I sat there. And he said, now if you're through with your little temper tantrum, let me talk to you. He began to talk to me. And man, did he love me. And in that moment, I was unlovable. But he loved me anyhow. And I'm so glad he didn't just look at me and say, you know what? I'm through with you. Get out of my face. He was a loving father who let me pitch my fit, throw my books, holler and scream, accuse him of things he didn't do. Put his arm around me. He loved me. He talked to me. We all need that. You know, sometimes I need my wife to do that for me. Sometimes you need your spouse to do that for you. I know I just hollered and screamed at you, but internally you're really going, man, I could, I could sure use your arms to wrap around me and hold you right now. But you're too prideful to say it, or at least I am in you. Just in God. He knows what we need when we need it, and he gives it to us. I don't know about you, but this has been a tough week. One of the toughest weeks I've had in a while. Mom was bad. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday was awful. She's crying. She's in so much pain with her stomach. Stanley and I can't do anything. We're praying. And in my mind, I'm going, God, how many times do I got to pray for this? I've even said this. I said, Lord, I don't see anywhere in your word why I have to beg you for a miracle. So why is that happening, God? And I told my mom, I said, Mom, I don't know what's going on. I said, but we're going to keep ringing the bells of heaven until you're healed. I said, that bell's not going to quit ringing until you're healed. She called me Wednesday right before Bible study. She she's bawling. And she going, I can't take this anymore. I said, I'll leave now and come get you. I said, we'll go straight to the emergency room. She's so fearful of hospitals now, she, she don't want anything to do with them. So I hung up with her crying. I'm not going to 
throw his love away and he's not going to throw my love away. I'm in it until I die. And then I'm going to be with him. And then I'm going to get my questions answered. But you know what? Those questions won't even matter when I get in his presence. Because all I want to do is just praise him. I'm just going to want to jump and shout and holler and scream and go, I made it, Lord! And then on top of that, I had some other things. And it was punching the gut. Took all my air. The way I thought this building was going to get built ain't going to do it. God's favor and man's favor over this building. We've got God's favor. We need man's favor. I've got another meeting set up this week with a different general contractor. I don't understand all of the ins and outs of dealing with construction and building and banks. I, I Mind you that I am from Rich Spring and I'm not the brightest crayon in the box. And I can tell you that every day I pastor, I feel more and more like God. Are you sure I'm the one for this? Favor don't look what you think favor would look like. You think favor would look like all blessings, but it don't. Let me take you to the birth of Jesus and Mary. She was pregnant before she ever was intimate with a man, and you tell me she wasn't talked about and ridiculed, and they could have stolen her. Favor don't look like what you think favor looks like. So what I thought favor was, God had different. This week is favor. Yeah. We're going to see the glory of the Lord. I want to pray this over again while they're playing. It's actually a scripture, but I, I want to pray it over you. Ephesians 3. pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your heart.
living within you as you trust Him. May your roots go deeper into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you be able to feel and to understand how long, how wide, how deep, and how high His love really is. And may you experience this love for yourself. Let that be for each one of us, Father. God, strengthen every marriage that's in this church. God, help them see that they can go through more than they thought they could go through. They're stronger than they thought they were because of Christ being at the center of the relationship. Lord, we need you and we need your love. Thank you for loving us when we are unlovable. Help us, God. Help us to redefine the marriage covenant. Let us get away from what the world calls it and get back to what the Bible calls it. Just the way you design marriage to be, Father, between one man and one woman. Help us, God, to have a love that lasts. If you're here this morning and you say, well, preacher, I've been pretty unlovable toward God. I've kind of shunned Him. I've kind of walked away from Him. I haven't listened to Him at all. I haven't read His Word. I haven't prayed to Him. I can tell you this morning that He still loves you and nothing you've done made Him love you less and nothing you can ever do will make Him love you more. He's here for you today. He's here for you today because His love will last forever. So if that's you this morning, if you're saying preaching, I ain't been too lovable. I'm sure God's angry with me. I haven't done anything right. But I sure hope He still loves me. If that's you this morning, right where you're at, just raise your hand and say, preacher, I need Him to love me. There's more. Yeah, come on. When you put them up, you can put them back down. Come on. There's more. I haven't been too lovable, Lord, but I need you to love me right now. If that's you, just put your hand up. Come on. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love me, Lord. Love me, Lord. Everybody in the building, I want you to pray this after me. Everybody in the building. Say thank you for loving me and forgiving me even when I don't deserve it. Help me to commit to you and love you the best I know how. Increase my awareness of your presence and help me to love others as you are loving me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on, somebody, give him a praise this morning. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
If you need more prayer, if you feel like you need some personal prayer, Miss Shea will meet you in the prayer room. Over here, you can go out the door to my right in the room on the right there. It's got glass in it. You'll see she will meet you over there and she will pray with you. But I don't want you to leave out of here thinking God doesn't love you because He does. And not only does He love you, but we love you. And we want you to experience Him more than you ever have before. Let's worship to this song.